Greetings and blessings, family. One love. Jesse Tree here with my uh, new friend, Matt Roski. Of, uh, is, how, is, how do I say your name, Matt? Roski. Roski. Of Cultivate Elevate. Uh, and Matt, I've been watching Matt for a couple of years now, and he is a, has a wide breadth of knowledge about um, all things sort of controversial and uh, the electric universe and what have you. So um, just, you know, he founded Cultivate Elevate to bring back information that has been suppressed and cause society to become sicker and weaker. His mission is to educate and empower individuals to rise above the state of fear because there is always solutions. And I really resonate with your mission, uh, Matt, and I thank you for joining me today. I thank you for having me on and happy to talk about some solutions to the nonsense. Yes, indeed. Wonderful. Well, um, to kind of frame the conversation, I wanted to talk about prana, the electric universe, and the end of lack, because we live in a time where there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of sense that there's not enough, you know, energy, food, uh, you know, um, not enough resources of all kinds, you know, water um, or health, access to health. And uh, so my experience has been that through permaculture and herbalism and uh, sort of the breatharian path that uh, the universe is conspiring in our favor, not against us, and that we have everything we could ever need uh, right at our feet, so or all around us, so to speak. Um, I like how you, like the, you said that. I think that that's important for people to realize that we're not running out of anything. You know, we're not running out of air. We're not running out of water. We're not running out of food. You know, we're not running out of anything. It's and even with the energy, like you said, everything is connected to the ether and the energy that's all around us. The chi, the prana, the orgone, the life force, you know, the ode energy or odile energy. And all of these terminologies have been considered woo woo in pseudoscience, as we've been told by our you know Rockefeller educational system. But, you know, everything is unlimited. And the more you get into it, the more you start to realize that we have abundance all around us. But we're programmed into a fear state to make us believe that we're running out of things. You know, and when I got into my journey of just even to electroculture and people growing food and utilizing electroculture, harnessing the ether, the beautiful energy that's all around us, they started increasing yields. They had more pollinators. They had more birds. They had more bees, more, you know, more food. And they didn't have to use as much water. You know, they didn't have to use as much water as they traditionally did. But that was just taking a little bit of copper and bringing it back into the soil and creating atmospheric antennas to gather the energy that's all around us. And the more I got into this topic and then I got into water, learning about how we're never running out of water because Mother Earth is always producing water that's coming out of our feet. You know, this is why when people go into mines, a lot of those mines would flood out because the water is just coming up from inside the earth, always regenerating 24-7, 365. And then when I got into energy and reading about atmospheric energy and the ether and all the old world antennas and all the buildings which were tapping in because of the resonance and the materials in which they were using, you start to see that somebody knew a lot about energy because you see a lot of, for example, light bulbs that are lit in about 1882, 1881, all that time frame, thousands and thousands to a point of it almost looks like millions. And you sit there and go, well, who, how were they, how were they getting all this energy? You know, where was all of this energy coming from? Because when you look at when the introduction of electricity and all of that came, the timelines don't add up to the pictures that you see in the 1880s and 1870s and timelines like that. But it's just remarkable when you start getting into all of these things, you see that a lot of this was removed off the periodic table. Ether was removed off the periodic table in 1908 so that we kind of stayed away from that. And then as that kind of turned into the future and you went, you know, 19, 20, 30s, 40s, 50s, people started disconnecting themselves from it. And like you were even seeing saying about doing breath work, you know, absorbing the ether because you have the air and the earth, all the energy that's all around us and taking that in, bringing oxygen to every part and every cell, you know, it's energy. I mean, that's how you, you know, if you think about like a lot of uh, tribes and cultures, they pump themselves up with breath work, chanting, dancing, and absorbing all that energy. So it's up to us to really kind of take a different step and look a different way 
than the fear that we've been put into and look at it like the abundance that has always been here. I totally resonate with everything you just said. You know, um, being a permaculturist, I've been, that was my experience when I started to do agroforestry and food forest gardening, as I began to see that human beings could do something that was good for the earth. And that not only that, but the, the earth would bring this um, enormous abundance back to us. And um, I started working with electroculture this year and uh, I had beehives um, that had been absconded. You know, uh, I had had wax moth in one of the uh, hives and um, so the bees left and I cleaned out the hive and I tried to bait it for a number of years and uh, couldn't couldn't catch a swarm. But this year when I put in electroculture, the bees came, you know, as you said. Um, and, and also with respect to what you said about the breath, you know, I've been studying the breatharian science, which is all this stuff as well. You know, you speak a lot about grounding, you know, sun gazing, sun bathing, and, you know, even breath work. This all creates and movement, sound, you know, uh, color, all these things bring energy into the body. And that I think this is going to be the, the new uh, cutting edge of health sciences is the, and they're actually, it's actually a field now of, uh, I think they call it uh, quantum biology, you know, where they're looking at like the exclusion zone water in your body and seeing how there's a positive charge on one side of the exclusion zone and a negative charge on the other. And there's the whole thing of alkalinity and acidity and breath work and all these ways that we can just bring energy in that's all around us, whether that you call that, you know, the zero point field or, you know, prana or what have you, there's more energy in a single square inch of space than we could use in like a thousand years, if I recall correctly. Um, yeah, you can't tell the Rockefellers that, you know, that's the thing. You can't, you can't tell that about that because that would debunk all of the systems in, that we currently have in place. You know, and the systems that are running out of energy, as we're always told. And the more I looked back into the past, you know, you got into a fellow named Nathan B. Stubbenfield, who was creating batteries that he was placing into the earth. And what he noticed was when he took those batteries and put them into the earth, they would get stronger and stronger just by the earth charging the battery to a point in which, which there was a discharge. So same thing with the electroculture that you were doing with your beehives you're bringing back that energy and those bees are attracted to it. Because if you if you think of little bees, you know, buzzing around, you hear all that energy or electricity that's coming off them as they buzz and then they levitate. And they're almost creating, in my opinion, a static field the entire time, which allows them to levitate. And you hear that the whole time. But it's just remarkable when you get into all of these things, because that's what Mother Nature is trying to show us. You know, Victor Schauberger was big in You Replicate Nature. And nature will go with you. If you go against nature and you put cell phone towers and all kinds of weird stuff all over, then nature is going to fall apart. But we have to work, like you said, on our land, on our soil, work with our land, work with the plants, the animals. You know, I see the birds in front of me right now. You know, they're all connected. You know, even the sound effects that come from the beautiful birds that open up the stomatas and allow all the nutrients to come into the plant. You know, everything is interconnected. And like you said, the, the energy that comes from this, if you get into cymatics and sound frequency and all of those things, everything is a vibration. Everything is a frequency or a fractal or a design. And, you know, the more we amplify that, the more we bring all that back. And like you said, with permaculture, that's what you're doing. You're working everything in unison rather than our traditional monoculture farming, which is usually one crop that's sprayed with about 4 billion pounds of glyphosate, which is an anti-life product. And then you're, you have no, you have no, the, like, you, you don't have any meshing, you know, anything meshing. You don't have birds and bees and little butterflies and all these beautiful things working together because you've decimated everything there. And then you have a lot of poisonous food as an outcome, which if the food has become poisonous, how do we eat it? How do we believe that that can sustain, you know, Mother Earth? It doesn't make any sense. But if we have all this abundance and we use the permaculture and the electroculture and, you know, you get into the even work of Steiner and all the stuff with the BD prep that he used to do and the quartz and crystals, you get so much into this. You see, we could have 
more than we ever expected. And Mother Earth is always giving that all the time. It's just up to us to if we choose to connect or disconnect. A hundred percent. And, you know, what you uh, you talk about so many interesting subjects and they all interrelate like the architecture and, you know, the architecture of the ancients, pyramids and, you know, stupas and all the different um, kinds of energy architecture that are put on ley lines and nodes and stuff. And, and now we have cell towers. And I've always thought of cell towers sort of as like an electromagnetic prison for the earth and the people of the earth. And, you know, I really love that you share about how to get off the Wi-Fi and get into a direct landline connection. <clears throat> but there, and there's a similar corollary with us that we can get a direct connection in with nature by spending time in nature and working with nature. And in permaculture, we're challenged to grow eight acres of food on one acre by, like you said, you know, like a coherent system that is self-perpetuating and layered. And, you know, um, and then I think about, you know, the addition of things like electroculture and Steiner's biodynamics and all these things you start stacking on and, you know, nature is an abundance machine. And um, we forget that our, you know, everyone's, you know, chanting about abundance and manifestation, but our true abundance is life and, and life is an abundance machine. And so, you know, it's, we will be going with the flow of life if we start to interject ourselves in the environment in this way and we'll be rewarded with health long life a beautiful world you know and sovereignty and i think this is you know really uh the medicine of our age that we empower ourselves to do so so love what you do matt love it thank you brother and i think that that's really important like you said is we need to connect to everything you know, whether it's permaculture, whether it's electroculture, whether it's dolmens. Remember when they used to take the stones and they would stack them on top of each other and they would create little dolmens and place those all over the different areas of the ley lines? That's another one, too, to amplify the energy. And I've actually experimented with stacking stones to see what would happen. Very large stones put into different fields, creating my own fields, like you said. And then when you get into these towers and these power lines and all of these other things, they're doing the opposite. Like you said, they're making a grid and they're pretty much reducing the life force in that grid. And what's interesting too, is you always see the towers placed right by water. That was always the most interesting thing. Everywhere here, for example, in Scottsdale, Arizona, the towers run up and down, right up and down the canal, up and down the water. And the water takes on messages. The water takes on energy. You know, So if that water now is coming in through the pipes into your home, now you have the water that's been destructured from the message that is being sent from that tower. You know, so we have to connect back into structuring because everything is about destructuring on this side. But even barefoot grounding, like you said, very important to connect to Mother Earth. You know, take off your shoes, take take your, 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 your shirt off, whatever it may be. Lay on the ground like a starfish and connect to the Earth. You know, you don't even need just your bare hands. You need your whole body because every cell is meant to be connected. And then Mother Earth will also give you information. I've sat out in nature plenty of times and just came to, had an epiphany, you know, and it's just because information is constantly around us. And that goes back into the ether situation as well. The information is all around. We don't need computers and anything else, too. We just need to tap in. And the more we become tapped in, the more we start to see how all this connects back to all the ancient practices and ancient buildings that you mentioned, too. You see all of those and sit there and go, these are remarkable work of arts. You know, the fractals and designs and all the beauty that's just there. And you sit there and think, you know, how was this crafted? What is, did they use sound? Did they use light? It almost looks like someone almost took a horn and was just crafting, you know, the stone and the granite and the quartz and these things because it's too perfect. You know, they weren't sitting around with a hammer and chisel, you know, just sitting hammering and chisel and doing that. Because you would have an error rate, you know, even if it was 1%, there would still be quite an error, you know. Mm -hmm. So you get into this and go, there's so much more. And they spend a lot of time, I can see it right now, trying to block out the skies and do all the stuff that they're doing to try to mm -hmm. lower our energy levels, lower our consciousness, dim the energy, and dim the awakening that's happening throughout society. 
because as people are kind of going through everything, and I think 2020 was the catalyst, but, you know, being healthy, not feeling good, being very disconnected from the earth, you know, all of those things I feel are resonating even more now. And people are just kind of over it. And it's only going to continue to happen where people are going to start to see, I could do this naturally and there's no side effects. Or I could do this side and it's just all side effects and leads to even a, you know, a, not a not a good path for my future. 100%. It's interesting because <clears throat> they're spraying out here today too. I was going to do the this video outside so I could just be in, in nature while we talked and you know, they came over and sprayed and everything turned gray. And today is the uh, uh, conjunction of the sun and the galactic center, which is kind of, you know, uh, auspicious. And that's something that comes to mind, too, is, you know, just thoughts about the Schumann resonance and the way, um, you know, 2012, you know, they talk about in um, some of the astrological information that you know the Kali Yuga was us going away from the galactic center in 2012 was turning the corner and coming back in and now we're being washed by these waves of light coming from the galactic center and that's pinging the Schumann resonance so that now there's we're having these massive spikes there's a big coronal mass ejection the other day or a couple of them that really you know uh, perturbed the, the Schumann frequency and I believe, you know, you also have your pineal gland, which has this microcrystal in structure that is perfect for wireless transmission and uh, reception, as well as your DNA. And I think that um, what's happening is essentially ascension, where as we go back in toward the galactic center, it's going to awaken our DNA, awaken us from the inside out. And we're going to be you know, able to understand the technology of, you know, pyramid building again, and, um, you know, maybe be psychic, you know, um, the whole thing of breatharianism, I've been uh, living on just liquids for six years now, you know, and, but it started with me getting into this information like 13 years ago, and just started sun gazing, and changing my diet, and, and grounding at that time you know, and, and then working with meditation more regularly and energy cultivation, you know, because it's not about just not eating food. It's about switching our bodies um, over to a subtle, a more subtle form of energy. And you talked about getting downloads from grounding. I, when I would sun gaze, you know, afterwards I'd cup my eyes and I remember seeing all this light play and patterns of geometries and things like literally I was getting codes from the sun, you know, and I believe this is just something that is always happening and we don't, these practices just dial us in. It's more like that direct, just like the ethernet co uh, cable. You say, you know, if, if you plug that in, you get higher quality reception, you know, same with if we plug into nature in this way. And um, so I think it's really actually the potentially uh, the, the beginning of a very beautiful time for humanity as we reawaken to ourselves and and uh, regenerate and rehabilitate our planet and get away from these systems of control that have been designed by the Rockefellers, et cetera. You know, the cabal of, you know, however many families have been controlling the situation on planet Earth for millennia. And we're going to realize, you know, our everyone has this unique divine intelligence inside of us. And that is the energy that is the prana and the chi that we are just like a, a conduit of. Um, so I like how you said that, because 2012, if you remember, they inverted that. Remember, they were saying, like, everything's going to be the end. You know, it's always the end. They always say that every day is the end. Yeah. But, you know, the 2012 was that significant day. But then if you say it that way. Now you're saying it the true side, you know, because everything's always inverted. And it's just something interesting to think about because, yeah, maybe there was a shift that began at that time. I think uh, Dolores Cannon talked about that, too, that there would be that shift in humanity and it would just continue. And it feels like that, you know, because even the interest in which people are taking now of topics and energy and, and pyramids and history and all these things, 
I feel like it's accelerating like this. You know, it's it's faster than ever. I mean, the stuff of the nonsense that we are always broadcast, you can see is just they're just losing views and people just don't really care for it. And it'll just keep shifting like that. And as you said, with sun gazing, it's funny because over here in Arizona, you know, the sun will be there will only be a haze as the sun is setting or as the sun is rising, which is funny because that's the time in which you do your sun gazing to get all the different spectrums of light into the eyes. And it's funny that you say that because when I go to bed sometimes at nighttime, I'll see all the colors. I'll see it while just before I'm about to go to sleep, like I'm going into, you know, the, the next state. I'll see the colors and see almost like, you know, flashing and different things, like you said, geometry and shapes and things. But that's the other thing is that that sun is giving us beautiful information. And when I've I, I do a ton of sun gazing, but in the past two of doing sun gazing, I've seen things or kind of rethought things. You know, I was sitting there thinking about one day like the moon and I'm like, eh, that's, some of these things don't make any sense what I've been told, you know, and whatever. And these epiphanies would kind of just come out and, you know, it's interesting, too, because they say the ancients used to eat the sun, you know, for energy and to awaken the body. And as you were talking about, too, with with having liquids, which are structured water and having pure, you know, structured water coming into the body, the body begins to heal very quickly. You know, it's only until we overcook things and separate everything and, you know, break it all down that it falls apart. But, you know, the energy for, from the sun, from the earth is so powerful. You know, and we're in our, the whole system now, at least as, as I've seen, is about like keeping us indoors, not seeing the sun, you know, putting petroleum based products and baking them into the skin to block out the spectrums, which you can see the intention. You know, it's to lower our frequency or our essence or our aura and then try to bring us down into this feeble state. But the, the thing is, is I keep seeing, in my opinion, of just the awakening that keeps occurring and it's only going to keep happening. Because it's 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 like I said, people have gotten to that point where, you know, they're just focused on more and abundance and rather than the nonsense of fear. And I'm running out of everything, you know, because you can only push people into a corner so much until they begin to rebel, which is funny because bells, you know, the frequency and everything. So it's just it's interesting as you get into all of these. But I connect a lot of dots that you do. And that's I think that's why our path connected us. I, I appreciate that it did. I really, you know, admire you. I, I think you're a, a sharp and kind and smart fellow. And I really love the way you've taken this on because you speak to a lot of truths that, you know, you have courage and, you know, to remember this, that's been part of my path with uh, this, you know, personal pra health practice that I've been undergoing this path, you know, of spiritual and mental and physical health is that our heart you know it, it taps into our conversation too your heart has this electromagnetic field that's so much larger than what comes off of your head or any of your other organs you know and um and like in astrology in medical astrology it corresponds with the sun and you know when, when you know something in your heart you know it without a doubt and it's also that place of compassion and of courage you know and so I think this, you know, sort of dawning is moving out of our heads and into our hearts because we all know this stuff. Everybody knows, everybody, you know, has the wisdom within them that when you step outside barefoot and you hear some birds sing and you see the sun, it lifts you up. You just feel it, you know. Um, you don't have you don't have to be told that to know that, you know. Um, and um, so you know, just learning to trust our guides and have that courage, I think is a, a huge part of our moving forward. And I think it is an inevitability, like you say, and, you know, I think that uh, the way in which the, uh, you know, uh, the social architects, I'll call them, have, you know, been contriving and trying to, they're trying to do so much to bring us down because we are so powerful. And our connection, uh, power, that power comes through our connection with nature and the you know, larger cosmos and everything they're trying to contrive and do here is so small compared to this like larger cosmic scene that's going on that we're a part of um that you know it's it's really kind of silly it's like a kid trying to like resist you know going to bed or something like that you know yeah. where eventually they're just gonna get tired out and go to bed, <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> 
Well, and the thing is, is like you said, is you know they're they're working around the clock to do this. But the fun part is, is that we have the internet, and the internet has really changed everything. You know, because now me and you can connect from all over different parts of the world. You know, we can connect to all different type of people. You know, you can learn about all different types of things in all different types of languages. You know, you can read books from times in which you know are published in a in a small library in the middle of a you know a small little island and things like that, and tap into this information. But you know that's 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 part of the revolution I see is because as we connect more and we talk about our experiences, which is another crucial part, then people start to see a different side, and that's how the truth comes out. Because everything I learned when I was in my you know dark rabbit holes of you know they're doing all these things and everything else is it just kept me in this dark rabbit hole, and that was it. And when I started to learn the solutions, I was like, wow, that's it. That's all we had to do. We just had to go out with some dousing rods and we could find water that's unlimited. Wow. Well, that that solved all that with the water on the stock market situation. You know, so just all these things that we can do. And, and that I think you is important that you said, too, is going with your heart and your instinct. You know, instinctively, you know what to do. You've you've you felt that your whole life, you know, and it's just turning that back on. And I think all of us, especially after 2020, have really turned on that instinct and that, that, you know, this doesn't make any sense, you know, type of situation and trusting our heart and then also showing more love and compassion because everything 2020 was dividing and conquering. Now we have the flip side where every, where people are coming together, you know, and you see this, even people, I'll see people on social media where someone will say something, another person will say something, and then they'll write like much love afterwards, or, you know, I, you know, I let love be with you or whatever it may be. And they don't even argue. And it's just amazing because that's what we're supposed to be doing, because that small group of people or whatever things they may be are trying, you know, to keep us all divided from talking to one another. Because if we talk like this and just have a very simple conversation, there's many more people, millions of people who are also feeling the exact same way. And then it gives us the ability to align with that and align with our path and connect more rather than divide. Because that divide keeps us from sharing knowledge with one another. Because you, if you figured out something great that's with gardening and it's not shared and people can't connect, well then that information is just lost. And that's why I see the internet as a beautiful blessing to all of us, because you can find information on anything now. Now, it doesn't have to be 100% true because there are things obviously Google and everything that does and whatever, but it really gives you a different side in which we never got because before it was the newspaper and the radio and that's it. And it was one side, whatever that newspaper said, that's what it was, even if it's not true. Now we have the ability to investigate and then ask other people what their experience are so that we can learn from that. But I see it as all, you know, what it was originally created for. And then now what I see it's being used for, it's just two different parallels and that's the same paths that we can take. You can have the path of abundance over here, or you could have the path of chaos over here. It's just up to you to what you decide that you want your day to be or your life to be. And it's it's your path. That's why I've learned. It's your path to do what you wish, you know, but we, we're all going to just keep either moving this way and kind of moving that way. I, I totally appreciate that. You know, I think it's important to give people the dignity of choice, you know, to that's that everyone deserves that dignity. And that's, it's interesting the way, you know, all these things that were meant to divide us, you know, like uh, you're saying the internet was sort of, you know, social media was kind of devised as a, like a control mechanism, you know, to psychoanalyze us and to, you know, play at our, you know, uh, most, uh, you know, weak, you know, places and also, what happened in 2020 and the way that was meant to divide us but the outcome was that people are now craving more of that connection people are gardening more to be more you know sovereign you know to, because you know while they were all on lockdown they couldn't like do anything they go outside and be out you know be with their family and work in the garden and you know it gave them that opportunity and um so I think that that's going to continue to happen. Something else that comes to mind, you know, is the the Hopi prophecy. You know, there's the prophecy rock and it shows that like Dolores Cannon said, you know, that there's this potential at this time of this bifurcation 
of people who basically choose the technocracy, you know, and the control system and people who choose nature and, and spirit or, you know, um, some people don't like that word, but maybe, you know, just your internal well-being, you know, um, and that essentially the, these going to be these two worlds going on simultaneously. And like you said, I, I feel that that's very much the case, you know, uh, and yet we're all still interconnected. And, you know, just to develop that compassionate mind, that loving mind, you know, and even include those people who have made those choices, you don't have to include what they do, but just to care for them, you know, and give them the dignity of their choice. So love all that. Um, I wanted to talk to you. I There's so many things, like I was making notes and I was like, oh my gosh, we're never going to be able to talk about all of this. <laughs> but um, uh, some of the things I wanted to talk with you about uh, are things like uh, just the, I think of these things in terms of earth, wind, fire, and water, right? The alchemical chemical elements, and that could be solid, liquid, gas, and energy, you know, in terms of sort of modern uh, parlance. But um, so we talked a little bit about energy and how there's this energy everywhere and there's all these ways in which we can connect in with energy. And we talked a little bit about earth, you know, and electroculture and permaculture. Um, and you mentioned water um, and the whole thing of like living structured water from juices and stuff. But I'm wondering if you've studied any about hydrogen water um, and the effects of hydrogen water. You're a wealth of knowledge. So that's why I put it to you. So with the hydrogen water, there's a guy, I think it's uh, the brown gas. It's uh, with the brown gas device. And he talks about the benefits of hydrogen water. And I forget what his name is, but he has a brown gas device that increases the hydrogen in the water. And it's interesting, too, because when I was researching about people who are dehydrated, they're lacking the hydrogen molecule in their body. So usually you can heal that with salt. That's usually one way to do that. You can do that with breath work as well, too. But, you know, the hydrogen molecule is missing from the water or has been pretty much decimated. And as they bring back the hydrogen, then they bring back the hydration. So, you know, when I got into that topic, it's interesting because water is fascinating. You get into like the work of Victor Schauberger, where he was spinning everything, creating vortices and vortexes, because that's how water is supposed to move. You know, our pipes don't move in the correct way, so they don't keep the structure of the water because everything's in straight lines. First, how things are supposed to curve naturally, how streams and rivers, you see that curve almost kind of like a snake, you know, and that's supposed to be there. But when I got into the hydrogen water thing, I've read a lot about it. I've seen there's a lot of devices. I never really kind of moved into everything when it comes to certain devices, just because I got a thing with electricity and Rockefellers and that whole situation. And it's hard to have trust. I have a lot, maybe a lot, not a lot of trust in certain things, but, you know, stirring water brings back the structure in the water. And people used to sing to the water as they would mm -hmm. stir it, you know, for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then they'd stir back the other way. You know, so I kind of stick to things that I feel that resonate with the natural way. You know, if me and you were out right now on the land and we had to figure out the water, we would have to use something natural. And it would probably be a stick and our voices and chanting and some sort of sound frequency. So that's kind of my thing with it. But I've seen a lot of things. I've heard great success stories with the brown gas and all these things. But I really never dabbled into them myself. But I've heard some great stories on that topic. Yeah, it's just something I've come into, you know, sort of recently, and I definitely love playing with structuring water. Like, you know, you're always talking about copper vessels, but you could use gold or crystal or glass, you know. Um, and one thing we used to do is we just take a glass jar, fill it with water, drop a crystal in it and put it in the sun. Yes. You know, and that would be a great way to structure water. And I really I'm really fond of those kinds of things, too, that are that you can have a direct relationship with and a natural relationship. And supposedly also when uh, you eat raw fruits or you make uh, fresh pressed juices, you know, that that has added hydrogen. Um, and they have done, I know they've done like, uh, I think it's like 1400 double blind, you know, studies, basically meta studies about uh, hydrogen and its ability to 
heal all manner of diseases. Um, and this, this whole thing of, you know, most of our bodies are water, most of the bodies of plants are water and the structure of water as just this, um, you know, it's like uh, the, the next generation of computers, I believe they're looking at using water crystals rather than silicone crystals because hmm. there's more informational density in a, a crystal of water than there is in a crystal of anything else. Um, and that water exists in three phases, unlike any other substance, it can be solid, liquid, or gas. You know, so there's sort of like this magical quality about water and the play with water in that way. I love, you know, the stirring, you know, or um, the crystals, or I've seen, you know, people making like uh, copper, copper orgone collectors that they can like put around their water, you know, stuff like that's really fun. So well, and Wilhelm for- Reich was big on the water. You know, his cloudbusters were connected up to water. He had the tubes which were connected to the cloudbusters, which were connected to the water. And that's what he was using as the source of energy. Because, you know, water water is, like you said, it has the there's the unlimited energy there. But it's interesting, too, because when you think of animals and they go out into the wild and they lick those things of salt, you know, the little salt, uh, it's like a little rock. That It's interesting because those I found out have 14 hydrogen molecules in them. So you get tons of hydrogen when they're looking those little salt uh, blocks that they're always going out to eat. And then if you think of the animal, it licks the salt. It has the salt now in its body. It stays hydrated and then doesn't need water for a long period of time. So, you know, the hydrogen plays a role. You know, you got H2O, you got two molecules of H of hydrogen and one of oxygen. So, you know, you see this and go, there is connections. And then when you go into fuel, there are many cars which can run on hydrogen and water. 1976, you have the the car that ran on water, and you have a whole bunch of other patents of cars running on hydrogen and getting phenomenal gas mileage, you know, hundreds of miles to the gallon. It's just not talked about. But, you know, we can be using water and the hydrogen to run our cars, run vehicles, you know, trucks, trains, all kinds of things. But a lot of this has always kind of stayed put because we're always focused on the oil and that whole system. But it's interesting because my buddy said, uh, you know, when they, when they make, I guess when they make natural, I think he was saying make natural gas. I think he was saying that when they make natural gas, they produce water. So he's like, how do we run out of water if we're always making it, you know, to get the natural gas or something like that. And I thought that's hilarious because the same industry would tell you we're running out of water, but they're creating water the whole time to create the other system that we have, you know, so how can we run out of anything when it's always being created all the time? Right. And, you know, that's the most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen. Yes. You know? And so it it's it's that kind of as above, so below reflection of there's this hydrogen all through the whole you know universe and in us and in the, you know, on Earth. And so um, this, you know, it's that's why I love this conversation, why I love what you do is breaking up these concepts of lack, that there really is no lack. There's no lack of energy. There's no lack of water. The only lack of food is one that's contrived. And that's all through these systems of control. Um, you uh, mentioned also the the hydrogen cars, you know, and that kind of ties back into more thoughts about energy. I know you've talked a lot about Tesla, you know, uh, and so I know, from my research, there's this whole thing of zero point energy and over unity uh, machines, you know, and that there's been many over unity um, engines that have been created, but they were, you know, put down, um, uh, you know, bought pat, patent, patents bought from people and then shelved, you know, or people disappearing or, you know, all this kind of stuff. There's a great documentary called what is it called? Uh, the Lost Century that goes into how we're a century behind technologies that have been developed. And you talk about this quite a bit, even with the hundred year light bulb. You know, I shared that with some people and their minds were blown, you know, when the, they actually Googled it and they're like, oh, wow, that's that's an actual real thing. And it's like, yeah, this is all contrived. You don't we don't need these light bulbs that break and LEDs that have this negative effect on our our biology you know um 
Well, but... and when you get into the technology, it's exactly what you said, the Centennial light bulb. It's the oldest burning mm -hmm. light bulb on the planet. And it's been burning for 100 and I think it's 110 years. And it's a four watt incandescent bulb. You know, the bulbs that they wanted to ban because they said that they're not efficient and all of that nonsense that we were told. But you have the oldest burning bulb on the planet and it's only using four watts, you know. But we have all these like 20s, 60s, 120 watts, 150 watts. And, you know, the great documentary on that is the light bulb conspiracy. And they mm -hmm. talk about how, you know, the electric companies got together and they started finagling the light bulbs to make them so they didn't last as long. And then they needed, you know, customers coming back. And then once they did that with the light bulbs, they started doing it with technology. They started doing it with cars. They started doing it with clothes. You know, they showed like the first nylon ever made. They could like pull a tank with it because it was so strong. But then DuPont got together and reduced that down so that it just fell apart. You know, so you see this and go, oh, my, what I remember when I watched that documentary, I was like, this is crazy. You're, you're making everything fall apart and then blaming us that things are being polluted, right? <laughs> because you're cre you created things to have the pollution and then you banned hemp on top of it, which was a beautiful resource, you know, connected to nature, which was very strong. And that was removed. But yeah, when you look into all of this, you see how a lot of things were removed. And then when you get into the patent offices, you see that the oil companies run the patent offices. So if anything that comes in that's not oil related gets banned or suppressed or removed. And then you have the 1951 Secrecy Act, which was to deem any inventions dangerous to the country they would get rid of. And if you think about Nikola Tesla, as we were just talking about, he had a car, 1943, that ran on the ether, the energy of the earth. And that patent or that car was never brought to life. They had pictures of it. But it never came, you know, on, on to uh, availability. So you start to see all this and see how we're so behind. You know, we are so behind. I mean, they even had pictures of, you know, computers, 1950s. You know, you had the first cell phone or telephone back in 1908, you know, wireless telephones that would connect into the earth and you could talk to your friends and family through the earth. You know, so we're using a cell phone in 1992 and it's like this technology has been around and safer, much safer at that time, you know, in the 1900s. And now we have all this inefficient stuff. And the most mind blowing one was when I was looking up the electric vehicle of, I believe it was 1888 with, I believe, Edison, if he was a real person. But he had a car that got a thousand miles to the charge and it was electric vehicle. Last year, they announced that they had a groundbreaking technology of an electric vehicle with 250, 250 miles to the charge. How was that groundbreaking if we already had the technology back in 1888? You know, so people have to really see through all of this and go back in time. I'm big on going back into books before 1920 so that people can see the truth and then also connect with that. Because as soon as you see inventions like that, people start saying, how do I make it? I'm going to make it for my family. I'm going to make it for my friends. We're going to try to reinvent this stuff. And that's what we need to be doing too, because we need to be going back to that time in which people were creating and bring back that innovation that we are now lacking today. I think you're right. And I think it's something that we should approach from an open source kind of a, a way, because that's the way they always get us is this connection with, you know, all of this plant obsolescence as you, pointed out is due to economic drivers, you know, economic motivations. And people will co have come up with thousands of these over unity machines. And then they, they holding on to their little patent because they, they want to be able to capitalize on it. But if we open source this information, then there's no controlling it anymore. Then it's wildfire, you know? Um, and you know, there's some, you know, I think in terms even of just the simple things like, you know, it takes a certain mind to do the engineering and to understand all those things. But even gardening, like, um, you know, after World War II, the Victory Gardens fed the majority of our population, you know, and it was just people in their backyards just yep. growing vegetables, you know, and how much we could reclaim of our sovereignty just by growing food, you know, for ourselves and how that creates 
uh, community resilience, not just individual resilience, but community resilience. Because if all your neighbors are doing that, and I'm growing, you know, amaranth and you're growing potatoes and, you know, we can, we can trade and we can share. And if I have a bad year, you know, and you have an overage, then, you know, what are you going to do with the overage? You know, you just, we want to share it, you know, because every gardener knows you, you know, your when your apple tree goes off, there's more apples than you can actually eat, you know, <laughs> or put away or, you know, dry or anything like that. So, you know, that, and it's a really great way in my mind to connect in with this sense of pronoia that the universe is conspiring in our favor, not against us. And, um, and know, I like how you said that because when I got into the electroculture situation and it's, it's taken off, you know, gardening has gone through the roof. You know, you had 2020, you had 150,000 searches, you know, per month in 2020, you know, 2021, you had about 300,000, 2021, you're moving into almost a million. In 2022 and 2023, you've moved into almost 3 million searches per month. You know, so people are realizing they want to grow their own food. They don't want to be part of this weird system and be able to give to their friends and family. You know, but as I got into all of this, you know, people could be exchanging, trading, you know, giving food to one another. And like you said, I had a friend who here in Scottsdale, she grew some apples. She was doing electroculture with her apple trees. And she, her whole tree is apples. You know, she's like, I got more apples than I've ever had ever, you know, and it's just like coated with apples. And she's like, I, every person gets apples now. They come over, I give them apples. They got <laughs> apple pie, they got apple this, you know, because you got so many apples and apples have beautiful enzymes in them that help heal the body from almost everything. But, you know, when you get into this, you go, we can have abundance, you know, it's all there and it's meant for us to connect with. And, you know, the other part that comes with growing food is sometimes when people are stressed out about growing food, when animals come and eat their food, they get angry. They're like, the animal The animal has taken my food. Well, the animal needs to eat too. So we have to have that, we coexist with nature. You know, deer, squirrels, chickens, everything, we, we coexist with everything. I have birds who eat my oranges, you know? I mean, that's that's what happens. And then everything comes and they eat them, so be it. You know, so that's the part we have to realize too, because we've been put in this, state you know like you said where it's mine you know this is that's ego too it's mine and it's nobody else's but we need to share and same with technology i know a lot of people and that's why i try to share their books because i know a lot of people of the people i've read in their books they didn't share a lot of the information in which i've read in the book and that was because they've waited towards the opportunity to share it and the problem with that is the one guy he actually passed away before they even gave him a chance to speak. So all of his information is now lost because of that. And then you sit there and think it's all in this book and his legacy lives in this book, you know? So it's so important that if people know something to share it. And then, like you said, creating communities and sharing amongst each other to help elevate and uplift each other. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And if every person, like you said, Victory Gardens, which were a popular one, everybody had food, well, then you don't got to worry about what the price of something is of what they're trying to you know, sell you because you already got it. You got cucumbers, tomatoes, potatoes, you know, all those beautiful things. You now can trade amongst with your friends who now grow something else. And then it's a completely different world. But if you're contained and you can't do that, then it's a different story. Yeah, totally. That's the this need to connect is something with each other and with nature at large, I see to be like the panacea, you know, to the problem, because, uh, you know, just this, it's something we can't avoid. We're inextricably interconnected, you know, and um, it, it actually psychologically, if you do something for someone else, it, it does the same thing to your brain physi physiologically as it, as if you do, as if you're the receiver of a gift or, you know, some you know something nice uh so it's it's something that benefits us on every single level possible and you know it in this time where there is such a sense of division because it's being sown you know intentionally whether it's you got the jab or you didn't get the jab or whether you're you know what your 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 gender views are or what you know everything under the sun 
they're trying to make into a divide, a wedge that they can drive between us. And we got to realize that we are one human family on this planet amongst a family of other beings, like you said, the plants, the animals, you know, and when we can open up to that, it actually makes our life so much more fulfilling to being connected with our human brothers and sisters, with the animals, with the plants, with the elements of the earth and the sky and the sun and the moon. And so it's a, it's a beautiful message. I love what you share. Uh, we're coming up to the end of our time. I want to uh, uh, respect your time. Um, gosh, I have so many things I want to other things I wanted to talk to you about, like monatomic gold and like, you know, rainwater harvesting and exclusion zone water and pyramids and chemtrails and magnetic motors. And, but well, you know, perhaps we'll be able to get together again for another uh, talk. Um, last one, though, I do want to touch base on uh, you and I are both part of, you have a, your own superfood company. I'm part of a superfood company. Uh, just if you want to touch on, what you have to offer out there for the human family to, you know, get into these greater states of health and awareness. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, and just superfoods and their benefits in general. So I had a lot of health ailments back in the past and it was just cleaning up my diet, going all organic, you know, and realizing that there's certain foods that can feed certain pathways and turn certain things back on. And a few of them being a couple of them that are on our website are Shilajah, pearl powder, and dragon's blood. And I would say those are the three top superfoods super that I talk about all the time. Chilajot is an ancient, it's basically, it's, it's ancient soil that has been compressed or compressed by the mountains. And that compression is just filling it with nutrients. You know, you have all that soil breaking down the decomposition of everything and everything just squeezing together, which creates the piezoelectric effect, you know, which we could talk about as well too. But, you know, you have that squeezing that's occurring by the compression of the mountains. And that, that beautiful shilajot has 84 of 102 minerals, and it's high in fulvic acid. Fulvic acid is great at detoxing the body, pulling things out of the body, and it's also necessary for plants. Fulvic acid and humic acid are necessary for plants too. So you get all these beautiful minerals to help heal the body and restore the body because a lot of our foods, as we've talked about with monoculture, are missing all the nutrients. The last study done on organic food was done in 1992. It showed that organic food yielded 100 times more nutrients than conventional that are sprayed with pesticides and everything else. So with Chilajot, you're bringing those minerals back into your body. And then with the fulvic acid, it helps detox and cleanse out the gut lining. Because a lot of people, what happens is you've got so much stuff sitting in your gut lining that it slows down your brain and it slows down the rest of your body because there's all that digestion taking place, you know, the crunching that's going on in your, in your stomach. So Shilashot can come in there and help cleanse all that out. And then next you move into pearl powder. You're going into pearls, the moon energy, the, the pearl, the essence of life, you know, creation or a seed of creation. And so, you know, you get into pearls, you have magnesium carbonate in there. You have selenium carbonate. You have a whole bunch of amino acids, which help restore the connective tissues of your skin and help feed the body. A lot of the times when people are suffering from restless leg syndrome, they're missing magnesium. And pearl can come in there and help calm the central nervous system. And then they've also shown that pearl helps restore glutathione levels, which are very important because our liver is on a constant, you know, battle with the nonsense that we deal with. They're always trying to shut down certain pathways. So the pearl can come in there, help heal the liver, heal the spleen, and get that whole connective pathway going again. Because that's also part of the water that we talked about. We talked about hydrogen. You have 2% structured water in pearl so that you can bring back the structure to the body. Because as we talked about, if you're dehydrated, body falls apart. And then the last one that we have on there, we have mushrooms as well, which I you know, can talk about, but I, I just keep it simple. But we have our dragon's blood, which is an ancient tree sap. This is connecting you to the sap of the plant. You know, turpentine, maple syrup, all those beautiful things that are great for the body, the saps that everybody used to use. But it's an ancient tree sap that has over 3 million antioxidants on the auric value, the highest on the planet. And it's really great at restoring the connective tissue of the skin and then also cleaning up the gut lining and cleaning out the blood. Because that's another one I know we don't talk too much about cleaning the blood, restoring the blood, you know, even beets, cleaning out the blood, getting everything going with the blood, because your blood is your life. You know, there's water in there and structured, all the structures in there. But 
Dragon's Blood is great at cleaning that up. And if anybody's suffering from skin issues, you can put Dragon's Blood on topically or you can take it internally and it'll help clean up those skin issues because it's interesting. They showed studies where a person had a wound and they used Dragon's Blood and they would heal within three days versus the people who did not consume Dragon's Blood would heal after 14 days. Hmm. So it gets into the whole stem cells regeneration and bringing in vital minerals, because that's what I realized. We're just missing things for each pathway. And as we bring those things in, we can start to heal like that. And if we keep doing the same thing, doing the same thing over and over again, you know, we can't really heal. But we have all of these beautiful superfoods on our website, CultivateElevate.com. With all the studies, I try to link everything and more information on there. But everything is about, my whole thing is elevating people on their home, their terrain, and how you can help elevate your health. Because when I had a lot of health issues, I had a bunch of professionals who told me it was genetic and I'm getting older. That's what it was. You know, 25 years old, I'm getting older and it's genetic. And I started to realize that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, I think you're lying to me. And then I started to take, you know, my own initiative and realize it was what I was doing, what I was eating, what I was drinking, the, you know, the frequencies that I was bringing into my terrain, the clothes, the lights, those things. And as I started to change all that, everything changed like that. And I thought that that was so simple, but we're not taught about these things because it, it keeps us in this loop, you know, and I realized that it's not genes and it's not any of the nonsense of you're getting older. It's just you're not taking care of your beautiful crystalline structure or your body, your temple. Mm -hmm. Totally well said. I love everything you just mentioned. It totally relates to my path in, in herbalism, but also with this breatharianism thing, like you were talking about, you know, pearl, you know, also the magnesium, you need more magnesium and silica and things like that for your bones and how that's a piezoelectric carbon silica crystal, yeah. you know, pyroelectric. Uh, and it's actually a res your body's actually a resonator, a semiconductor and a superconductor. And so Having these, you know, the things like the folic, fulvic acid, I know, can also detox, I think, things like graphene and yep. stuff like that out of the body. You know, um, if you're looking for a protocol to, to heal, you know, and that thing of mineral density that all the, all the cells want to buzz with electricity, but you got to give them what, what you, you know, what they need to do that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I really appreciate your time with me today, Matt. I've been wanting to connect with you for a long time. It's It's been a wonderful heart connection. Um, and uh, I know uh, the viewers got something from this. If anyone you know wants to hit up Matt for his super food products, I will be putting his uh, links in the description. And um, is there anything else you wanna add, brother? No, just on that topic of you know electric is they shock you back to life you know, when you pass out. So think of electric right there, you know, that's what you are. And the more you amplify that beautiful electrical conductivity of your body, the healthier you are. And the more that fades away, if you gunk up the body with all types of toxins and things, the body begins to fade away as well. So, you know, just on that topic, think of things as just conductive and non-conductive. That's pretty much your whole body, you know? And as you were doing breath work, like as you've been doing, taking in that en the energy, you're increasing conductivity. You know, it's increasing all that beautiful conductivity. So on that topic, I just like to say, you know, there are solutions and you don't have to live in fear. Cheers. Cheers to that. Oh, OK. Well, thank you so much again, Matt. Thank you, everybody who showed up for the live. And uh, everyone have a beautiful day. Remember, you are abundance. Abundance is everywhere around you. And you are an amazing you know, creation of the universe. And so let's, let's go out and spread that, that vibe. All right. Cheers, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye, Matt. Till next time.